We now come to our second featured presentation of this conference, and this is presentation by Dr. Suchi. Dr. Suchi was educated at Zhengzhi University, Johns Hopkins, and Columbia University as a political scientist. For the first half, I shouldn't say first half, for the early years of his career, he worked as primarily as a professor, as a teacher, as a scholar. He taught courses in political science, and but then his areas of expertise included international relations and international law. Then one day he woke up and had a new resolution. He dedicated himself to public service. And by my count, over the course of the past 20 some years, maybe about 20 plus years, he has given himself to public service, especially with regard to the whole question of mainland policies of Taiwan. So from that vantage point, he has done a lot of policy making, thinking, and strategizing from various positions, including the Mainland Commission of the Nationalist Party, the Mainland Affairs Council of the Executive Yuan, and of course, there was a period of time when he was a legislator, and then most recently, between 2008 and 2010, he was the Secretary General of National Security Council of Taiwan, and from that position, continued to implement, to envision and design mainland policies uh, with Taiwan at the center. He is author of several books. His most recent work, it's something that is going to require a while before um, before uh, the, the, the world will be admitted to uh, its uh, details. But then, so the one before that, <laughs> most recent one, it's entitled Weixian Bianyuan, on, on the brink of the abyss. I believe that's how he's done the translation. Uh, from the theory of two states to one stage on each side. So uh, shall we, let's welcome Dr. Suchi. Uh, thank you, Wenxin, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, my good friends. Uh, we're reaching the end of a long day. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm tired. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm kindly invited by Wenxin to uh, share with you some of my thoughts on the cross relations. I'm delighted to do so. So, um, but I, I, I like again uh, express my gratitude to you for inviting me here, and uh, I learned a great deal from the papers uh, presented until earlier, and I learned a great deal because uh, the topics that you dealt with uh, are uh, not those I, I'm familiar with. So I li really listened with great interest. Now, uh, let me share with you some of my thoughts on Cross Strait. I titled it Overview and uh, Prospect. This issue has been plaguing us for a long time and looks like it's going to do so for another, I don't know, at least a decade or so. I do not want to predict beyond a decade. But let me try to, give, to sketch, uh, I'll divide my presentation in several parts. Uh, one, uh, a brief sketch of the past 20 years. And then secondly, something about this year, at least before the presidential election. And thirdly, uh, I will uh, talk about some new factors which are emerging on the horizon, on the mobile horizon, beyond the presidential election uh, from my perspective. OK, um, what are, what is the, the, the overview. I um, uh, did low. Where's low? Low is low is right there. Low, uh, uh, low and I, um, I low and I, we studied Sino-Soviet 
Uh, he was my senior, but his reading was my must reading when I was a graduate student. Uh, I completed, I finished my second book in 1991, again on sign of Soviet. But at that point on, Soviet Union collapsed, and we went out business, so I needed to do something else. Voila, there was cross trade relations, brand new, coming up. At that time, it was so new. I remember this very well. It was so new. We didn't know how to call it. There was not even a term, a noun for this relationship. So I don't know how, on what occasion, one occasion, someone came up with this term, and everybody thought, wow, that's good. That's, that's the way we should call it. So we began to popularize this term. And then the issue came up, how to translate it in English. Well, then, you know, through some kind of brainstorming, this cross relation came up. So that was only in the beginning of 1990s. I don't remember the date or the year and whom. It was too early. And from then, when there was no, not even a term until this point, where, where when this relationship uh, is uh, what I call which, by the way, is my latest book. Uh, the title of my latest book is called A Tail Wagging Two Dogs. And from a non-existent relationship to this point when Taiwan could literally bring the, the, the greatest power, superpower, US, and the most populous power in the world, China, into conflict, military conflict. Taiwan's the only place, only factor that can do that. And I can share with you uh, some of my personal experiences when I worked in the government, when I was a Mainland Affairs Council chairman. We had to, you know, some of you know Taiwan politics. We had this uh, thing called Zhong Zixun. I don't know how to translate it into Zhong We uh, uh, We spent, uh, the ministers spent 10 weeks each uh, legislative session, so 20 weeks per year. Every minister spent uh, Tuesdays and Fridays in the legislative UN. And the premier would stand here and be questioned one by one by, you know, uh, in sequence by the legislators. And uh, whatever the questions are, the, the premier has to answer. And sometimes he said to which end, he could call out a minister. And all the ministers are sitting there. I mean, 20, uh, 30 of them sitting there. And they, they could be picked by the premier to help him answer the question. And usually a legislator showed up, and the, the, the following 30, 40 minutes would be his. And you look at him, you decide, OK, this guy is a transportation guy. And the transportation minister would be on guard. Everybody else could relax and read newspaper and uh, <laughs> writing letters and uh, looking at your gongwen and even writing a book. <laughs> and if, if say, a uh, agriculture guy showed up, then everybody else would be relaxed except agriculture. And when I was MAC chairman, I found out that I was the only one of the two. The other one is spokesman who has to be on guard all the time. I was the other, only other person in that cabinet where as long as the legislator is standing, I have to be all years. Because this guy is Aboriginal, agriculture, transportation, uh, uh, you know, whatever. You know, ideological guy, defense guy. He came up, he talked about defense, all of a sudden switched to cross trade. Talk about transportation, all of a sudden switched to cross trade. Everything has to do with cross trade. And that was only in the late 1990s. I served as chairman in 1999 to 2000, uh, May. And now it's, you know, it's still the same picture. So uh, it's something that uh, I, I have to uh, uh, give tip my hat for you uh, for putting this uh, group of specialists together to study this further, because this is really something that I think is, is definitely an uh, uh, impact on Taiwan, but also on the rest of the world. So how do I view this And through as a scholar? And let me see what I put in my. OK, I asked Kevin Lee for a pencil, and she wondered, 
what I'm going to do with it. OK. Anyway, in my view, the cross relations can be viewed as a spectrum. And this pencil represents that spectrum. So uh, there's, there's uh, the sharp side, and there's the soft side, the rubber. This is the pencil. And uh, there are five dimensions. Uh, on this spectrum. And the sh sharp side the, is the military. And softest is the cultural. Inside culture is economic. Inside military is diplomatic. Where my fingers are is political dimension. So two hard dimensions, sharp dimensions, two soft dimensions, and one hole in the middle, which can be either or can be neither, or can be flexible. The political dimension can move around and move the whole thing. And just about every issue we talk about today, or when I serve in the government, or when I study this issue, just about every issue, large and small, could be put in one of the five. So I always look at all five dimensions almost at the same time, never to the exclusion of any. So if some people try to focus on the soft side, fine. If some people try to focus on the hard side only, fine. But in my view, that kind of analysis skews the picture. Because in cross-strait relations, until now, all five relations have to be considered. And OK, now again, with this, this spectrum, uh, I would divide the past 20 years into four stages. Four stages. Before 1995, let's say, 1988 was the cutting point, uh, January 13, when Li Denghui assumed the presidency after the death of Jiang Jingguo. Uh, from that point on to, let's say, recently, four stages. The first stage, all five dimensions went soft. All five dimensions went this way. After 95 Cornell visit, all five dimensions turned around, went this way went this way. I'll explain the details. And after 2000, an odd picture, odd phenomenon showed up. The hard hardened. The soft softens. So very distinctly different three stages. And the fourth stage, after 2008, again, all five dimensions uh, are turning toward the soft side. But this soft stage under my administration is different from the soft stage under former President Lee's administration. I'll explain uh, somewhat details later. OK, let me begin with the uh, stage one uh, uh, before 95. Before 95, 88 to 95 is uh, what I would call the golden age of Taiwan, uh, Republic of China, and uh, never been so good. Never been so good. Never before, never after. Uh, economy was good. Taiwan went through democratization uh, while China was still uh, under the shadow of the Tiananmen incident. And uh, the two sides of Taiwan Strait, for the first time ever, uh, began talks to each other. And Taiwan purchased a large amount of hardware from the US. And Taiwan's, Taiwan's uh, international relations really expanded. Uh, the point at the lowest point in our diplomatic recognition, in terms of recognition, was 19, uh, 1988. 1988. It was, uh, I think, when US cut relations with Taiwan, we have uh, diplomatic relations with only 23 at that point. And when 1988, it dropped down to 21, 21. And between 88 to 95, we went from 21 to 31. And also, Li Denghui at the time, as president, he could travel to some parts of East Asia, I mean Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, if I remember correctly, four or five. I mean, that's not happening now. It happened then. Vice President Lian Zhan, Li Yuanchu, also 
travel to other countries. So that was the point when cross relations were good, Taiwan's defense was secure, uh, national security was safe and sound, uh, diplomatic relations, international relations were also good, and economy was good, political process was good. So I, this is why I call it golden age, and all soft side. I'll give you another example. And because of this golden age, Taiwan was very confident in itself, uh, congratulating us, itself all the time, among myself included. Um, the GDP was uh, uh, Taiwan. Taiwan and China was was one. Taiwan is one one third of China's GDP. I mean, despite the size, and now we are we are one eighth of China. At that time, we were one third of China. So Taiwan was very confident and very proactive in just about everything. I'll give you an example because that was my portfolio. I was the vice, uh, I joined the government in December 93 after Guang talks. And I was put in charge of the cultural exchanges among my portfolio. And uh, there was an idea came up, the two, the high schools, four best high schools in Taiwan and four best high schools in China. Uh, some in Beijing, some in Shanghai, uh, came to kind of agreement to send uh, 100, if I remember correctly, high school students to Taiwan to, to live in with the families in Taiwan, go to classes together for one month. And uh, we were not, in, the government was not interfering with, with this project, but we were informed of this project. And we, of course, we were very pleased that this was this went on, this was going on. But then after, say, a few weeks after the agreement was signed, we were informed by Beijing that, uh, well, one month was too long, maybe we should cut to two, two weeks. And we said, you know, fine. And then I said, okay, the living with family was too troublesome for you guys, maybe you should live in hotel. Fine. Uh, then, uh, uh, Something else. I mean, just cut down, water down, water down. At the last point, said, sorry, we couldn't come. So at that time, Taiwan was very confident, very proactive in inviting mainland students. Mainland was reserved and guarded. Now the situation reversed. It's a matter of confidence. Taiwan, I think, Taiwan exhibited, exhibited lots of confidence in itself at the time because the situation in general was very good. Came Cornell visit 1995. Lots of stuff changed. Many, many, many people have talked about that in this and other places. Uh, missile uh, crisis, and that changed everything. That uh, uh, psychologically, you know, uh, Shelley talked about identity. That was the that was the point. 1995 was the turning point. After that, uh, before that, Chinese identity was way high and Taiwan did low. After that, Taiwanese identity went up, Chinese identity went down. Uh, and, also, um, I rem and also the e economic, economic uh, re interchange continued uh, on, but at slower pace, at slower pace. Li Denghui, if you remember, uh, enunciated this uh, uh, go slow policy. So even the soft side economic dimension uh, went slow. And then, again, I tell you another personal vignette of mine. Uh, this February 1999, when I, uh, when I went back to uh, Council, uh, Midland Affairs Council as chairman now, after some detour in other ministries, uh, in the first week, in my very first week, I received a petition from a group of visiting performing uh, group from Sichuan province. It's called, I'm sure you know, called in Chinese called Bian Lian. I don't know how to translate that. I mean, you're nodding your head, you know what I mean. A face off or something. You just shake your head and the, the, the picking opera mask, you know, change color. I and mean, just so fast you couldn't tell how it was done. I mean, that's so popular, it's, it's the highest class uh, highest state uh, certified by, by the central authority that is the best art, artist group in China. And yet, 
they gave me a petition. I wonder why. Then I found out, well, this group, the agency in Taiwan, the, the company, invited them over and tried to book them to have some show, uh, give some show in a few times in Taipei City, in Taichung City, and Kaohsiung City. Then Kaohsiung, the, the sales were not good, so they canceled Kaohsiung. And then after a while, they found out Taichung was no good, so they canceled Taichung. And then finally, even the, the sales in Taipei City were poor. So the agency decided that they're, they're going to lose money. So they just uh, disappeared. They just uh, disappeared, dropped the whole group in Neihu, in an apartment in Neihu. <laughs> and those guys just you know, got stuck in the Neihu and knowing nobody and uh, just, just all of a sudden gone. And they had no money, no, no nothing. So they somehow pet petitioned to my office. And I, I found out, I said, of course, I mean, you know, we, we, we give them some, at least some, you know, provided uh, the flight, the tickets home, going, going back to Sichuan. But what struck me was my previous experience and disagreement. The contrast was so, so sharp, so, so stark. And this, this arts, this cultural dimension is moved by market forces, not by any government propaganda or something. It's, it's market. It's people's. Zhenxin, how people view China, how people view the cross strait. So in other words, the soft dimension, the softest cultural dimension, even in late 90s, went down. Not to speak of military and diplomatic and you know, confrontation. So, and also you know in 1999, after Liang Guolun, after President Li's state to state, uh, state to state relationship, PRC jet fighters began to fly out of Chinese mainland toward and along the, the center line. Until 1999, Chinese jet fighters stayed out of Taiwan Strait. And that was, a, and again, militarily speaking, that was a turning point. That militarized the cross strait relationship, which is still, I think, a, a, still a very salient uh, feature in the relationship. So the second stage, all dimensions went hard. Third dimension is odd. I mean, going opposite directions at the same time. So cultural dimensions went back way up, began to go way up. Performing arts, telephone calls, faxes, emails, visits, marriages, you know, just about everything. The cultural relations went up. Economic relations went up. In 2000, uh, uh, trade with China was 25% of Taiwan's total trade. And trade with US happened to be also 25, 2000. And now it's 40% with China, 15% with the US. Even though this 15% with the US, in my view, quantity is the same, but quality is good, very good, better than trade with China. But if you look at the sheer volume, the, the quantity went down with the US, with, went up with China. So the economic and the cultural dimensions went way up, warming, softening. But at the same time, the, the hard dimensions went harder. The military particularly. Uh, I put that in my book. I don't. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't want to say it now. But uh, there were some quite. There were some incidents during those eight years, which really went to the brink of, uh, of conflict. And then military. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, internationally, of course, there were lots of uh, confrontations here and there. And uh, you know, we lost. Uh, we lost. Uh, uh, when Li Denghui uh, handed uh, power to Chen Shui-bian, we had 28 diplomatic allies. And, and when Ma Yinzhou took over, it was only 25, 23. So we lost five altogether in eight years. In, yeah, in eight years. So uh, this, um, so during this, this third stage, um, the, um, uh, the the opposite the opposite movement of the 
the soft and hard dimensions. And, uh, and that, that paved, the, paved the, uh, the ground for Mao's ascendancy because people at the time were generally unhappy with, the, with uh, first of all, with economic uh, uh, well-being. Uh, people, like, you know, people like me, a professor or government employee or whatever, even legislator, nobody, even until now, we have not had a pay raise for 10 years. Can you imagine that? During the, eight, during the decade of 90s, uh, almost every year we had at least 5% pay raise, so 8%, the best was 13%. I still remember that very, very well. <laughs> and now, for 10 years, zero pay raise. So the economy was in bad shape, and the military insecure uh, to the point that people began to talk about whether um, China uh, now is capable of uh, denying, delaying, or disrupting American interference uh, should something, something uh, you know, bad happens to Taiwan. And uh, as I said, the economy, uh, the, 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 the ratio of GDP went down from, from one third in the early 90s to one quarter, one fourth in 2000 and one eighth in to um, 208. Guangdong uh, surpassed, Guangdong province surpassed Taiwan in 208, and uh, Jiangsu 209, Shandong 2010. Uh, so three provinces now outperform Taiwan in GDP terms. And that hurt, especially South Korea. Yu uh, 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 San, I believe, showed that. You know, uh, I remember again very well because I took happened to have taken part in that meeting, when when South Korea was uh, hit by the, the financial crisis in 1998. Uh, Korea's GDP was uh, two thirds. GDP, uh, yeah, GDP was two thirds, I think, at the time of Taiwan, despite the despite their population is larger. But after the crisis, they went down to close nearly one half of Taiwan GDP. And, uh, and I happened to take a part in a meeting with President Lee presiding. And I don't want to say, somebody said, in, in, I said, he said, he said it would take six years for, for Korea to get back to where they were before the financial crisis. But look what happened to South Korea. I mean, 10 years time, power transfer, they still, you know, now they surpass Taiwan. So that was uh, the hit home uh, to many people in Taiwan, and uh, uh, this paved the ground to uh, Ma's uh, newly um, uh, found, newfound popularity. But also during the uh, eight years, KMT, Ma, Ma himself, myself, we reflected on a lot of things. This is what I think uh, I, I'm sure DPP is doing. After you're out of power, you will reflect. And we re reflected on what went wrong. What went wrong with the country, with the party, and, and with the political style and all that. So we decided that uh, uh, some lessons should be learned. I, I will skip. Uh, the political part, the party reform and all that. I'll just talk about the cross-strait. And I, uh, through my own research, I, I found out that uh, both sides, Taiwan Strait, uh, committed uh, serious mistakes. And uh, in the late 90s, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin tried to, out of euphoria of new relations, new strategic partnership with with the U.S., began to launch a new policy, uh, which I would say promotion of unification policy. First time. First time. I didn't know that until uh, after John stepped down, John Zemin stepped down after 2002, because he published his collected works in the tradition. And I found out in a, um, I forgot which volume, but uh, during Clinton's visit to Beijing in 1997, and uh, Jiang personally told Clinton that was printed that uh, 
but basically said he encouraged the U.S. to uh, contribute to unification of China. And we also heard from other sources that that was, you know, people in China began to talk about timetable of unification and all that in the late 90s, 1998, 99. Uh, this pro-unification or push for unification strategy, in my view, backfired for China. Because uh, I, as uh, this goes to show how our government uh, was compartmentalized. I was chairman of mainland affairs. I was not aware of this remark. I don't know if Li Denghui was, but he never told me. I mean, I didn't see any document uh, that uh, would suggest that Jiang Zemin made that re serious remark. So I was not alerted at all. But apparently, I think Li Denghui was alerted. So he launched his Liang Golun study. Liang Golun study. And, uh, and also, um, uh, this. Um, push for unification strategy on the part of Jiang Zemin backfired because it, it, it must have grown out of uh, deep hatred for, for this uh, master uh, evil guy, Li Denghui. But it backfired because it produced somebody worse. <laughs> and it actually, it ha actually galvanized the pro-independent DPP and the pro-independent, shall we say, faction or force or elements inside KMT to form alliance, cross-party lines, and resulting in the victory of Chen Shui-bian, which in policy terms was worse than Li Denghui for China. So push for unification backfired. And then, again, use of force. 1995, 96, and 99, after Liang Golun was announced. It also backfired because U.S. factor was brought in. After 1979, when the Taiwan and China, uh, U.S. You know, cut relationship, uh, U.S. Uh, military aid was, uh, to Taiwan was uh, occasional at best and um, uh, you know, half-hearted. Not that much. Uh, then 1999, it was driven by events. U.S. was brought back into the picture. So if I were in Beijing, I would say use of force backfired. China, China earned a, a bad image in the world. And in terms of cross strait, the, the big giant was brought back into Taiwan Strait. And then Chen Zhebian committed its own share, his own share of mistake. He thought Taiwan identity, rising identity, could lead him to slide into Taiwan independence. As I explained during lunch, I said, in my view, there are two sets of uh, poles in Taiwan, always two, always two sets. These two sets are very different. You, one should not mix these two. One set is identity, and that set is heart. It's about heart issue. And the other said unification, independence, and uh, status quo. That's the head issue. Head and heart, they're not located in the same place. They're different. They're different. And so you have a heart is pumping. It's very Taiwanese. But that doesn't mean your head want to go for independence. Uh, we, Yu San uh, pointed that out very, very clearly. I mean, these pictures are very, very, very consistent. And even during Jiang Jingguo's days, when Chinese identity was very high, much higher than it is now. But even at that time, Jiang Jingguo's policy was status quo. In other words, Jiang Jingguo did not, not follow his heart, he followed his head. But Chen Zhebian made the biggest mistake by believing that he could change, he could follow his heart and the head will follow. Most people said no. Most people said no. And uh, so we learned that lesson, hence came with this Ma Jo's uh, three no statement. No unification, no independence, and no use force. This instantly struck a uh, very respondent chord in Taiwan, also in mainland, 
and I know in Washington, D.C. So that became, still remains our fundamental policy as long as Ma remains in office. I, I mean, during this term. I, think, I mean, after the election, I will explain later. So now, <laughs> now three notes. That's the fundamental. We learned that. And another thing we learned is that, look at this macro picture. Taiwan's uh, GDP is only 1% of the world GDP. Uh, if you rank Taiwan's GDP with other countries, Taiwan is somewhere 18, number 18 in the world. We are, compared with European countries, we're, we're smaller than all, than all those old imperialist power, like the UK, uh, Germany, uh, France, uh, Spain, Dutch. Uh, but we're larger than Belgium, Austria, Sweden, Norway, you know. Uh, if put Taiwan in, in, in Middle East, we're big power. Put in uh, Africa, we're superpower. <laughs> but where we are, we cannot change geography. We cannot move Taiwan out into the ocean. Where we are, we're only 1%. US is 25, Japan is 8%, China is 8%. So we're, we're sitting among 41% of world GDP. That's our fate. That's our fate. Like it or not, that's where we have to deal with. So we decided that uh, Taiwan is in Taiwan's interest, and also I'm sure in China's interest, because China has lots of other things to worry about, and also in US and Japan, everybody's interest, that Taiwan should make friends with China. It's our neighbor. It's an opportunity, but it's also a threat but we should strive to maximize the opportunity and minimize the threat. And that soon, during the campaign, became our uh, fundamental thinking. Uh, and then um, we, following that uh, logic, uh, you know, uh, we adopted this 92 consensus. 92 consensus, uh, mm, you know, I was uh, ridiculed for eight, eight years uh, for this 92 consensus. I, I never, I never uh, argued, I never retorted uh, my, you know, those criticism because I, my intention was, I, I coined this term in April 2000. And for the intention of uh, bringing uh, DPP and Chinese Communist Party together, uh, hopefully they would continue on the dialogue track. I was very afraid. I knew it was very difficult for the Taiwan Strait, uh, being working on the decades of hostilities, to have this dialogue at all. And. Uh, and, uh, oh, I don't, okay, I have, a, I have another pen here, okay. And, and China, and let's say, let's say this is Taiwan and this is, this is China. And KMT and the China has at least, there's some overlapping ground. Overlapping ground. Uh, uh, so, so this is what we call one China different interpretation. And on this over, overlapping ground, two sides could sit down and talk. But this DPP and, uh, and Beijing, there are no, no common ground. And DPP's uh, came, communist uh, demand was basically, uh, to, to put it in English, say yes to one China. And, uh, and KMT says, yes, but. Yes, but. That's our, that's our way of dealing with this one China. And DPP's position is no. So there's no common ground between yes and no. There is a common ground between yes and yes but. So KMT was going to go out of power. So what, I, I was leaving office. I thought to myself, you know, if, uh, really, if dialogue was to, to be uh, suspended, it would not work in anybody's interest. So I came up with the idea of 92 consensus, which is basically to wrap up yes and no and yes but. Wrap up all three and denoting it with the concept of time. 
And the term consensus was so vague that nobody knows what it means. <laughs> and consensus, consensus is, a, is, a, is a Western term. It's not a, you know, in a democracy, you don't need consensus. You need command. You need consensus only in democracy. You need to work, it, work with each other uh, and to build up consensus from bottom up. So it was a term borrowed from US. Just like uh, uh, Bob said earlier, religion was borrowed from Japan. I didn't know that. You know, this is a new term. So we, it, we use this term. I use this term to denote to, to it, this, this, this consensus with China. And uh, I was very surprised that China hinted at acceptance of this new term as early as August 2000. I, put, I also put that in my book. It's all, it's all with citation. Yeah. 2000, uh, August and November and January 1st. Chen Chi Sen came out January 1st. Uh, I mean, not 1st, January 2001. So clearly, uh, 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 Beijing was accept, I mean, uh, receptive to idea. Another trick with 92 consensus, which I privately pointed out to my DPP friends. Unfortunately, they didn't buy it. I told them uh, that Nitus consensus basically is a new term, and it deletes something DPP hated most and still hate vehemently. That is one China. The KMT says it's on one China different notation. There is one China, but in Nitus consensus, this four four Chinese characters, the term Chinese one China is gone. So I don't see any reason why DPP should, uh, should be so uh, vehemently against it. But uh, maybe because, uh, maybe because uh, it, it's not the term itself, it's the, the messenger is the, the problem. Anyway, um, the PRC was receptive, and so it quickly became, also became KMT's consensus, and we built relationships on that, on that basis. And, um, also, also, we realized the depths of the, um, the problems between the two sides. So we, early on, we, we, we realized that we have to go from economic issues, from this, uh, the soft side to hard side. So we work from economic issues to uh, political and military. I mean, political, uh, we shove the political issues and, uh, and uh, also leave the diplomatic, international and military issues to the, to the future. And that has been the strategy. And uh, during the last um, during the last uh, year, during the last two three years, we managed to accomplish uh, negotiations with China and signing you know lots of agreements. And uh, one time I commented that I became a uh, uh, some sort of a, you know attracted a lot of attention. I mentioned that there are now dozens of. Uh, 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 you know, more than a dozen, I said more than a dozen uh, channels between Taiwan and mainland. And the media quickly interpreted it as secret channels. But that's not what I meant. Uh, what I meant was just channels. Uh, because we, we signed 15 agreements. Each agreement implies a channel. So, so air transportation authority and their air transportation, financial administration and their financial, health and health, Coast Guard and Coast Guard, I mean, you name it, police and police and, you know, just channels. Fifteen, in my view, is too few. We have uh, over, we have probably 60 with, with the U.S. and 50 or 60 with Japan. And, uh, I mean, official bureaucratic channels. So between the... China and the U and Tai uh, between China and Taiwan, there's so 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 much trade, so much uh, uh, mutual visits and, and uh, exchange of visits, and we got to have more channels. Uh, this is something I will talk about later. And uh, so in the in the last few years, uh, uh, as I said, uh, someone earlier mentioned, uh, you know, uh, what uh, what what. Uh, you know, Thai PRC gave us gave us uh, uh, concessionary benefits. Uh, no, no, we we gain we gain what 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 PRC connections 
what, cons what was the question about this morning? It was a something question about PRC's concessions. In my view, PRC made quite a number of concessions to Taiwan. I'll give you another example, uh, which was a uh, little noticed. Uh, well, many concessions of PRC was, were not uh, given uh, adequate attention, partly because Ma administration decided not to, uh, not to blow, it out, blow it out, not to say too much about it. For, I'll give you one example. In summer 2008, Olympic game, Olympic game uh, held in Beijing. Lots of uh, heads of states were there. And you know, uh, our team was called Chinese Taipei ever since uh, Los Angeles, uh, 1984. And uh, it was officially, it was just in, in English, Chinese Taipei. But in, in Chinese, two sides call it differently. We call it Zhonghua Taipei. China call it Zhongguo Taipei. All right, and for, for almost almost 30 years. And in, in, in summer 2008, we decided, well, for our team to be there and to be called Zhongguo Taipei by Chinese official organ, by Chinese media, was totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. China made a concession. China made a concession. They decided that, OK, they dropped the term Zhongguo Taipei. They switched to Zhonghua Taipei. That was their concession. That wasn't easy. That wasn't easy. That was very early on in the year 2000. This, this is why I, I always say, I, I, in my view, Hu Jintao leadership was, is uh, very pragmatic. And I would encourage you, since we're all scholars, to read the press release that, uh, that Guo Taiban re, uh, re, released uh, sometime. I forgot the date. You have to check. That was, it was a very long press release. But uh, it contains the very face-saving uh, statements plus uh, the substance of concession. Very interesting statement. But that was one of their concessions early on. And then, of course, you know the WHA, you know the APEC, Lian Zhan's representation, which is highest ranking uh, representation by Taiwan, and, uh, and others. I can give you some other international, you know, on some international occasions, uh, there, were, there were also very good interaction between the two sides. And also, we decided uh, both sides uh, uh, without consultation, decided that we should f just freeze the number of diplomatic allies. So 23, just 23. So we set up, we set up no offices abroad. China set up no, you know, set up, you know, since China also refrained from stealing our allies. And, but despite this pattern, we managed to set up a new office in Sapporo, Hokkaido, Japan. That wasn't easy. That was a breakthrough. Again, uh, many people were not uh, quite aware, at least not familiar with this, this type of PRC concessions. I'm not speaking for PRC. I'm speaking the truth. Uh, because we deliberately decided not to propagate these breakthroughs. Because we, as we feel, knowing China, knowing Chinese mentality, as soon as we call it breakthrough, we won't get it anymore. We want substance. We want this to be normal. This is just normal life. This is just normal relationship. You know, there's nothing to brag about. Sure, we accomplished it. Sure, PRC made the concessions pragmatically in terms compared with the past, but this is nothing we want to brag about. So, so very few of us uh, go out and say, you know, listen, we did what Chen Shui Bian never could have done. We didn't do that. This way, the concessions kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, for our benefit, also for the benefit of the cross free relations. That takes a lot of political guts for President Ma. And uh, he didn't get much point at home, unfortunately. <laughs> so he's, uh, there, some people kept saying that uh, he, uh, you know, he, under his leadership, the, uh, Taiwan's quote-unquote sovereignty suffered. I, I totally disagree. 
I totally disagree. All right, uh, that was, um, mm, that was, let me see, where was I? Okay, now, this year, this year, uh, okay, uh, this year, <clears throat> this year, because the elections are coming, uh, so I, realistically, I do not expect, expect uh, many other major, major, you know, to use the word breakthroughs. We will continue with the ECFA, we call it ECFA plus. So other than, other than the, this, this ECFA thing, we will negotiate four agreements, uh, commodity trade, uh, uh, services trade, uh, settlement of disputes, and investment guarantee. I would urge you to pay more attention among the four to investment guarantee. Uh, it's still been discussed. I don't know when. I don't know the details now. Uh, it was an issue that was uh, started off uh, back in 1995. It was an issue on agenda. PRC agreed to talk about investment guarantee in 90, early, sorry, 1995 because at that time we were, Taiwan was the largest investor in, in, in mainland. And uh, we felt insecure enough that we, we kept push into China for negotiation, and they agreed. And then, of course, uh, Cornell uh, derailed all that. And now we're going to talk about that because PRC is interested in coming to Taiwan. But at the same time, Taiwan is also being, being a small guy. It's very guarded. It's very guarded. We successfully talk about financial exchanges. One thing, any, any of the state banks, any, uh, I think one uh, top one, two, three, four, four, at least four top state banks. E each one of the state banks equal the size of the entire banks, all the banks in Taiwan. So being, being a small guy, is, uh, living in a small pool, small pound, we have to you know, be cautious about the, the bigger catfish. Um, so, so we are ne negotiating this uh, the investment uh, from mainland to China to Taiwan. Would it be uh, in the form of uh, setting up a, uh, setting up manufacturing plants or in the form of uh, buying up shares? And if so, to what extent? So these are being considered by the experts and uh, by political leadership. But this would open door um, mutually for our investors to mainland and finally and for their investor to Taiwan. So this is something that I would, uh, personally, I would pay attention. The second uh, thing that may happen is uh, both sides will try to avoid, uh, avoid uh, troubles, conflicts, and, and all that. Uh, I, th I think the U.S. is also interested. So I, I also happen to notice that this, I mean, last year there were so many, uh, so many bushfires in uh, East, East Asia, and yet both China and the U.S. Uh, uh, um, carefully kept Taiwan out of this uh, new, new uh, bushfires. The third thing I would uh, I would pay attention is DPP. Uh, KMT has consensus uh, broad enough to encompass just about all the major, all the, main, all the politicians. But DPP is different. DPP, as I said, DPP does not have a consensus in, internally. And uh, I, sense, uh, I sense that DPP is, uh, is changing uh, from, my, from my personal contacts and uh, discussions. Uh, but DPP has been, DPP leads have been telling their supporters, masses, that uh, uh, about, about the feasibility and desirability of Taiwan, Taiwan de jure independence. They cannot back off very soon. And those supporters are so brainwashed. And uh, so, so literally these elites uh, who are now even having second thought, they are still, in my view, being kidnapped by their own supporters. So they're going through this uh, agonizingly, going through this agonizing process of recalibration. And I encourage them to do so. And I, I openly praise the, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen for setting up a think tank as a platform to, uh, 
to forge an internal consensus. I hope she would be successful. And this is something to watch. This goes to show, in my view, I may be wrong, this is entirely judgmental. In my view, I think uh, after this 20 year of democratization, many people in Taiwan are tired, are tired. Everything is politicized. Uh, Tom talked about IUP. I mean, even foreign language teaching. I mean, even foreign lang uh, Chinese language teaching by foreign, two foreigners, it was politicized. Everything under the sun can be politicized, and people are tired. And uh, so the pendulum swing, in my view, is not as wild as before. And people are looking for, for a... Uh, more, uh, I don't know how to describe it, uh, less wild uh, swing, which is good, but uh, not still, we're still watching. But that's, that's the mood, I, I sense. Uh, so not much will go on. And uh, the, during the second half of this year, all these newfound pragmatism may be there, may be gone, depending on, the, depending on the, how the election is going to shape up. But coming next year, uh, coming next year, uh, prospect, I promised Winshin I'll say something about the prospect. Of course, I don't know what will happen, but I notice uh, three new factors on the mobile horizon. And new, by new, I mean they were not there until now. They were there, but they were not uh, salient. They were not prominent. They were not any way important. Uh, first was China's internal situation. This I would view if there's any single factor that would determine cross strait. It used to be Taiwan's election. It used to be maybe uh, some individual leaders, Li Renghui or something. But I think in the future, the single most important factor determining cross strait would be Chinese internal politics. I may be wrong, I hope I will be proven wrong, but that's what I suspect. Because of three uh, reasons. Number one, in my view, China, uh, well, so I, I'm not as qualified as you are, I'm basically an IR person, uh, but my understanding of China is that it, it is uh, shaped more like a uh, Chinese dragon, like the logo of the Institute of East Asian Studies. Chinese snake-shaped Chinese dragon, not the British, not the English dragon. Uh, because uh, this is a, Taiwan was a textbook case of, of, of uh, develop, de, uh, you know, the, the uh, stable development. Taiwan went from economic development, stage one, to social pluralization, probably in the 70s uh, and 80s, and then political liberalization, late 80s, then institutionalization in the 90s. And now I think we're still caught, uh, we're still mired in this institutionalized stage. The final fifth stage is, is uh, civil society. In my view, we're still quite distance away. So we have gone through three stages, and we're now stage four. China, being a snake, uh, parts of the country is still struggling with economic growth. Part of it, the country is already in the social pluralization especially the coastal areas. And the whis whiskers of the dragon are probing toward political liberalization. Liu Xiaobo and the, the, the lawyers, professors, women in you know, some you know, small, very small minority. And so Chinese leadership is, unlike Taiwan, Jiang Jingguo and Li Denghui, they're, they're, they're coping with three sets of very different pattern, different issues at the same time. It's very difficult. So they psychologically, I believe, 
the level of anxiety is very high. Uh, uncertainty is very high. Uh, uh, so um, this is something we, uh, we, we should take in mind, uh, especially con taking into consideration their power, their power transition next year. Uh, entirely new crop will, will come out. And that's, that's, that's the, the, the context is very different under the new uh, leadership uh, compared with Hu Jintao. This is factor number one. Factor number two is the internet. Internet uh, is, uh, is beginning to serve as a opinion aggregation and uh, dissemination uh, tools very effectively. Uh, thick and quick communication. And I, uh, so far, the communist machinery is, party machinery is handling this, uh, but uh, I don't know how successfully and how long uh, it will continue to be. The third factor, which uh, I think is highly important for Taiwan, is that more and more new actors will appear on the scene. On, on their policy making toward Taiwan, on their policy towards the U.S., on their on everything, new actors inside party, inside the government bureaucracy, and outside in the society, in the in the businesses, in the in the. We uh, when we negotiated with ECFA, we personally experienced this. ECFA was not about just about the two governments and and all that. It's also behind our delegation, there was a whole range of business interests and labor interests. The same with China. Behind the negotiation, there were a whole range of business interest groups and labor groups. And these issues, these will, they will become more, more vocal and more, they will make themselves felt more and more very proactively, and uh, so, so, so I would rate this as most important because we don't know yet. I don't know if the U.S. does, but at least in Taiwan, I don't know how these different diverse groups view cross-strait. We don't know. It takes a lot of study. Do they view Taiwan through the lens, the prism of nationalism or through democratic lens or through business interests. It takes a lot of study because these guys are brand new. They just all of a sudden appear, just like Taiwan politics. I mean, you know, uh, in, the, in the old days, uh, uh, the, the Washington just had to deal with the president and just uh, and a few ministers. And now Washington, uh, you know, AIT has to deal with every legislator. I mean, you know, there's so many actors, so many people can pull the trigger. And China is going in that direction very fast. And we don't know who these people are, what, how they view Taiwan, and uh, what are their expectations. They may have expect different expectations. When Chai, if, if Tsai Ing-wen or Su Zhenchang or whatever DPP can, candidates, if they win election, they may have one set of expectation. If Ma ying wins the re-election, they may have another set of election, uh, expectation. We just don't know. We just don't know. It takes time. And because the actors are going to be multiplied and uh, they have a new leadership, uh, so the policy-making process may very be different from what we learned in the textbooks and uh, in, you know, until now. So, so I would urge, myself included, that we have to start China study anew on, on, on this, this type of thing. Some studies have been done, but, but not enough. And uh, we, Taiwan, because we always bear the brunt of any problems in cross strait we have to put more, devote more attention to this. And the second uh, new factor is that the fact that uh, uh, because of this, this new, fa new actors, uh, and also because the cross-strait relations is qualitative different now after ECFA, and also this year. Because now, until ECFA, the two governments were connected. Two parties were connected. And then came ECFA. Two economies were connected. Now, this year, this year, if everything goes right, we will have 
a what we call free and independent travel, FIT. In Taiwan, we call it 自由行. In China, it's called 个人行. And this new opening would connect the two societies. So two governments, two economies, two societies will be connected, which means, which means there will be more accidents. More accidents. I mean, I mean these actors. I two 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 guys came to mind. Most recently, a Mr. Chen Guangbiao. You know the filthy rich guy. Is um, he just he just you know out of nowhere popped up and went to Taiwan, decided to hand it out to hand out cash, and stirred up a lot of talk. And there's this movie director Jiang Pin in Tokyo. Again, came out of nowhere. I never heard of this guy, and all of a sudden he made some comments, and the people had to scramble to to clean up after his comments. I mean, this kind of thing will happen over and over again, and from out of nowhere, from I don't know what corner, what people, what gender, what class, what education, you just don't know. From their side, from our side, it's just, you know, this accidents will, in my view, will proliferate. Proliferate, and we, we really have to be prepared. And I think my my knowledge of the cross strait uh, uh, dealings, I mean relations, uh, I'm a little bit worried. Um, I put it mildly that 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 we are ill prepared for these accidents. And these accidents, if handled well, would be all right. But if not handled well, mishandled, it could uh, spiral into something. Worse. So, in other words, in Ma's uh, first term, we were mostly managing opportunities. And now, in the next four years, whoever in the Zhongtong Fu will have to manage opportunity and accidents, if not threats. If not threats. Yeah, so far, I'm pretty confident that China is not posing. <coughs> A huge threat to Taiwan. So I would say economic opportunity management plus accident management. The third new factor would be US China relations, which is totally outside Taiwan's realm. And uh, if US China relations uh, worsen, uh, as what happened last year, it would constrain the cross strait relations and would, uh, would radicalize uh, the, uh, you know, some some elements inside Taiwan, and I'm sure uh, lots of people in China, which would also spill over to cross strait. So it so it is in Taiwan's interest to see U.S.-China relations in, if not in good shape, at least uh, stabilized, stabilized. Uh, and uh, but you know, from our part, there's there's no way we can we can interfere with a small guy. We're at the receiving end of this uh, relationship, but we, we do hope that China and the U.S. would, uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm sure it's in, in the interest of these two big powers to remain talking and to remain on cooperative terms. In that, in, in, under this umbrella, the, cross -strait, the Taiwan and Beijing could learn to manage uh, a, a, this new uh, stage in, in, the, in our history. Um, yeah, beyond that, I don't know. Beyond that, I don't know. So even if you ask me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer other questions. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you talked about at early on in your, your very stimulating talk about the difference between quality trade and quantity trade? OK. Quality trade meaning, uh, for instance, uh, Taiwan's, um, Taiwan's uh, you know, the, the electronic, we talk about T TSMC. I mean, the, the technology, science technology, and the basically came from, from US. And, uh, and also the market was also in, in the US. So 
with, with, uh, with China mostly low, low end, and with the US at the higher end. And US is the upstream, we're the downstream. So even though it's 15%, but we cannot do without those 15%. Yeah, it's almost like Japan and Taiwan. Taiwan used to import lots of machinery from Japan. Everybody complained about huge trade deficit, but we could not do without Japan's imports because it was it's upstream. Yeah, that's what I mean by quality. Yes. Dr. Su, you mentioned that uh, there's a striking difference between stage one and stage two. And uh, these two are divided by the um, 1995, 1996. And in uh, stage one, everything was up, and stage two, everything was down. Um, so what touched off this dramatic change? Was it the visit by Li Denghui to the United States? Would you consider that a mistake, or is it simply the overreaction from Beijing? And if that is the kind of thing that turned everything downward, uh, has there been any lessons okay. learned? Very good question. I've been asked this question uh, several times, uh, not many times. I, would, I always answer it this way because I reflected on this myself. If we were to face with this situation again, would we continue to push for this Cornell visit? My answer is yes. Because in, at that time, because Taiwan's mood was that we had been We've been isolated, we've been in the closet for so many decades, and we want to open ourselves. So we open ourselves politically, which is democratization. We want to open ourselves toward China, which is a new relation with China. But at the same time, we want to open out to, to the world, which is symbolized by Cornell. So you cannot cut the China part, you cannot cut the, the, the international part. These two come together. So for Taiwan's point of view, I think there was an inner I, uh, need. Uh, but somehow this uh, collided with uh, PRC's view. PRC's view has to do, first of all, of course, national interest. They feel that, uh, that it's the Taiwan, again, playing the American card and America interfered, this or that. They also, Jiang Zemin per took it personally because Jiang Zemin never visited the uh, U.S. and now Li Denghui uh, beat him, you know, beat up, uh, uh, you know, by, by going there first. And uh, Jiang Zemin was also under uh, attacks from the conservatives at the time, before the visit. So this very complex uh, number of factors involved. Uh, but also goes to show how fragile the relationship was at the time. Uh, and uh, it was almost, almost if, if it happened, I mean, it, it was in a way in inevitable because people, the two sides did not understand each other that well. The two sides had uh, mistaken expectation of each other. We thought, I mean, probably, I mean, the Taiwan at the time, thought PRC understood this, and PRC probably thought that we, we gave you uh, enough room already, and they, they, they probably felt Taiwan overstretched its reach. So uh, I think uh, communication wasn't good enough, and the expectations uh, were misplaced. This is why I, I you know, answer toward the end, I think. We have to watch because expectations change. Politics is all about expectations. And uh, China, I don't know, Xi Jinping leadership and other new actors, how would they expect of Taiwan? And on the Taiwan side, after the election, I don't know the composition of the D5UN, you know, but what the, there will be new expectations being built up through the process. This is uh, the management of these uh, mutual expectations. It's a very difficult task takes a lot of uh, discussions, yeah, but, um, but we learn. I mean, both sides learn. So we, we uh, in the last two years, we managed uh, quite a number of uh, difficult issues. Uh, for instance, Dalai Lama visit to Taiwan. It was a very touchy issue, very touchy issue. It was, uh, you know, the, 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 the Beijing raised hell with uh, with other countries, including U.S., about Dalai's visit. But we, we managed it because both sides, both sides uh, you know, uh, 
with, with these experiences in, in the old days. So we began to, that the communication is very important and um, understanding and appreciation of each other's difficulties and needs are very important. Yeah. But, well, we still make mistakes. Everybody does. Yes. Dr. Su, thank you. Um, two follow-up questions. I know you said you wouldn't engage in predictions too far into the future, mm -hmm. but um, I was struck by your description of the negotiations around the 2008 Beijing Olympics and the PRC's willingness to adopt uh, Zhonghua Taipei as the, as the name. And I'm wondering if you could speculate a little bit about possible um, moves in the future toward establishing representative offices on either side of the state and what you think terminology might be uh, in that regard? You're talking uh, about, yeah, yeah. This, this issue is, uh, is uh, being discussed in the newspaper, in the media right now. But uh, as far as I know, my administration takes the position that uh, right now it, uh, the timing for the time for the representative exchange of representative offices uh, still not mature. So they encourage the uh, trade associations, uh, other you know, functional associations to set up offices in each other's places. And yeah. then my second question has to do with the framework of your talk, which is focused pretty squarely on cross-strait as well as ties with the US. Uh, the recent incident with the Philippines yeah. suggests that actually a regional perspective perhaps would be helpful in this That's regard, right. and oh, I'd yes. like to hear your thoughts on the, oh, yes. the oh, yes. sending I, I of agree, Taiwanese back to I China. Agree. Again, this is a, uh, a little bit sensitive now. I'm not handling this. I'm, I'm, I should not uh, make uh, open suggestions. <laughs> But uh, this goes to show that yes, they, the, the yeah they, we we actually um, we have very good relations with Philippines and with other countries, and uh, I really deplore the fact that this uh, came out this way. It it could have been avoided. Yeah, it's not as complicated as uh, some other issues we have encountered. I can say that much. Yeah. Richie, thank you for coming today. Um, I just have a question when you were talking about the 1992 consensus, mm. and you said that um, you actually deleted the term One China in order to try to make an agreement between the KMT and also the DPP. Can you just elaborate more exactly on what you mean when you deleted the term One China? And a follow-up question to that would be if there are internal shifts within the politics of DPP, as you said, would their position on the 1992 consensus change in the future? And then maybe predict on what those changes will, will be. Uh, 92 consensus uh, is a uh, Old wine in new bottle. The, the label was new, but the bottle was old. The wine was old. I just gave it a new label to make it more palatable, acceptable to both China and DPP, hoping that they would pretend that they like it. Then, then life goes on. The life goes on. Yeah. It's like a computer you know, access code. It just goes on. And. Uh, and uh, I was not sure at all it would be accepted by Beijing. I had no contact with Beijing personally at the time. And uh, even after I left office, I had no contact with Beijing. So I had no, no idea. So I was very surprised that in August, uh, I saw a hint that they would actually like it. I mean, accept it, not like it, accept it. So, so uh, and DPP, on the other hand, uh, I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't, you know, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen even went out of the way to correct the president about this term. So I, my hunch is that uh, Dr. Tsai is not going to accept this term uh, during the campaign. And uh, if she does not, then she, she, she has to come up with something else which is palatable to all sides. Yeah. It's it's not sacrosanct. I mean, you know, no no term. It's a, it's a, you know, people people always uh, people always say there's they find they look for all the documents they didn't see this term. I mean, this is not academic issue. This is a political issue. Uh, I always argue 
I always argue uh, that uh, the 92 consensus is actually the tip of iceberg for the two sides to resume or to start conversation, dialogue, you need an iceberg. What is an iceberg? One, you need internal consensus. Two, you need mutual trust. Mutual trust. If you have this two, you can call it tip of iceberg by any name, by any name. PRC accepted the study to consensus with, with KMT. As time went on, the, 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 the firmer commitment to United Consensus because they knew that KMT was not going for Taiwan independent. They were, they, they have this mutual trust. And we knew that they're not gonna push this issue very far. They just, we just stopped right there. So there was a mutual trust. At the same time, there was, mutual, there was internal consensus inside, inside DPP, inside KMT, to sustain this, this dialogue. With this two in place, the, the, the discussion could go on. This also, I have to elaborate a little bit further. Under Li Denghui, Li Denghui was, Li Denghui was faced with the same uh, conundrum as Chen Shui-bian faced in the year 2000, except that Li Denghui faced were old senior mainlanders. They were very anti-communist. And deep, so Chen Shui-bian was senior Taiwanese, native Taiwanese, who were very anti-communist and anti-Chinese. But there was a major difference between Li Denghui and Chen Shui-bian. Li Denghui went out of his way, out of his way to convince, to coerce, to cajole those mainlander seniors to tell them, please, we're trying something new. This is good for Taiwan. And you know, you don't have to approve, but you please don't don't oppose. Hundreds of them. Li Denghui went to the houses of, of many personally to say, and some of them I say cajole companies or uh, cajole meaning, you know, give you a house and you retire. That's a, that's one way to do it. But others convinced them. And, and so Li Denghui went out of the way to form a internal consensus, intra-party consensus, which was not existent. And remember, Li Denghui had secret uh, uh, dialogue with, uh, with China. And uh, his missionary, his, his envoy, was his secretary, meaning he did not trust nobody. He didn't trust anybody outside other than his, 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 um, his secretary. So there was not much trust you know, vice versa, the, the, the KMT bureaucracy, PNT, old hacks didn't trust him either. So he went out of his way to, to talk to those guys and for intra-KMT consensus. That, I'm sure, was not lost in the minds of Beijing. Beijing said, this guy is serious. This guy is serious. And this is mutual trust. And this is internal consensus. And KMT never did, uh, 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 Chen Shui-bian never did that. Chen Shui-bian had, of course, these uh, senior people who were, uh, who were, who were you know, very, uh, very vehemently anti-China. Anti but Chen Shui-bian did nothing to assuage their fears and anxieties and all that. He, instead, he was, he was kidnapped by those guys. So, so deep people would say, you know, why should I trust this guy? So this is why I feel internal consensus is very important, highly important, and mutual trust is highly important. With this two, the, the term, whatever you use, it's, it's all right, it's all right. It's really this iceberg. It's really this iceberg. The tip can be caught by any other name, any other name, yeah. And this is uh, the problem Chai Ing-wen is gonna face. He may, he may accept the 92 consensus, but he still has to convince that, well, this is not just me talking, but other DPP people are not talking this way. Also, this is not me talking now, but in the future, I may be talking something else. And this is mutual trust issue. It's very serious. Yeah, this is something DPP has to face uh, squarely in the, in the near future. Yeah. Well, I used up my time. <laughs> Oh, yes. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, I think, uh, uh, yeah, this is, thank you. This is, a, um, uh, this is something I think Taiwan can contribute 
to the world. Uh, we haven't done much. Taiwan, uh, Taiwan uh, has many people, some are represented here, uh, uh, you know, who are well-trained, schooled in the US and other places in the UK with social sciences uh, 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 skills. And, uh, but in the last 20, 30 years, uh, US uh, of scholars could uh, do field study in China. And Taiwan scholars were generally prevented either politically or financially from doing that. Nobody gave money to these scholars to do field study in Taiwan. So I really sympathize with especially sociologists, uh, so those people who really have to blend in and just be there. I could read documents and write out a book, but, but those people who really want to know China, they can't. And in the future, I think the task is uh, upon us that uh, because China is changing so fast in the direction that we don't know, and even they don't know, even I don't think Chinese leadership uh, is sure of their own development. So, so, so Taiwan, uh, we happen to be linguistically uh, equipped and now uh, scholastically also some uh, equipped. So I think Taiwan uh, scholars should join in the new, new venture to, to study China and uh, contribute our, our analysis to the world. We may complement whatever American and European scholars uh, could do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.